Hey friends, so I wanted to give you a first-hand account and my thoughts on what these orbs are. So last week at the Monroe Institute, I was lucky enough to spend the week with my friend Ryan Bledsoe. This is Chris Bledsoe's son. And we spent several nights way deep into the night, staring up into the night sky, calling in orbs. It was so much fun. It was a life-changing experience. And when you realize that you're surrounded at all times by this spiritual energy that is sentient and conscious, can read your mind and will interact with you, it really is just mind-blowing. So these are my initial thoughts on it. It made me think of the seraphim from the Bible, right? So the seraphim were the angels that were the closest to God in the hierarchy of angels. And they're depicted, <coughs> sorry, I'm still sick. They're depicted as an eyeball with like six wings. It made me think, okay, so seraph means to burn, right? Seraphim means to burn or burning. And when you see these orbs, they're like burning balls of plasma. That's what they look like. Okay, now they were depicted as eyeballs, the seraphim were. Well, whenever you see these orbs, you feel like they're watching you. You feel like they are intelligently monitoring you, not in a nefarious way, but in a loving, guided way, okay? So that's where the eyeball comes in, because they're watching you. And then the six wings. Back then, they would always put wings on things to denote that they can fly. So anytime something flew, they put wings on it, and whenever they would uh, illustrate artistically. So the seraphim have six wings. Now, why would this be? Well, when you're watching these orbs, they don't just fly in straight lines. They'll fly in circles. They'll stop on a dime and shoot this way. So I think the six wings was denoting that they can fly omnidirectional, not like a bird, so, okay? So I think when they were drawing these seraphim, when people were talking about the seraphim, what they saw is what we're seeing now. These were the angels back then, right? Now we call them orbs, but I think they're still angels. <laughs> I think these are spiritual energies that are very, very ancient, very high up the hierarchy. They're here monitoring us watching over us, guiding us, probably even protecting us. And they do interact with you. They read your mind. Whenever you see them, you can like call them in. You can say, you're not taking control of them. <laughs> they have full control, but you can say, I'm ready to see you now. And you can set an intention. My intention is to see you, please show yourself. I'd be very grateful and appreciative to show yourself. Then when they do, you can say, thank you so much for showing yourself. And when you thank them, a lot of times they'll flash. They'll do a little flash bulb and to, as if to say you're welcome. And you can say, you know, to prove to me, right, to my left brain, that you're not a star or a satellite, could you do a little loop? And they'll do a little loop a lot of the times. It's the most amazing thing. And that part reminded me of a dolphin. So I live in the Gulf of Mexico. I swim and, and paddleboard all the time with dolphins. I love them. And they're very playful. So you have this creature, this animal, this being, the dolphin, that is highly intelligent, highly spiritual. You're sitting there looking them in the eye and you're thinking, you're smarter than me, aren't you, buddy? but they're very playful. Even though they're very highly intelligent and spiritual beings are playful. They will put on a show for you. They'll entertain you. They like to make you smile and laugh. They're amazing like that. They're very childlike. And when I was out there watching the orbs with Brian Bledsoe, he said that about the orbs, that they are childlike in nature. It doesn't mean that they're immature. It just means that they're playful. They like to play. So that's what I noticed. And it's so amazing. So here we have something that's ancient, something that's spiritual, pure spirit something that's close to God. The, the seraphim were one tier down from the creator, you know, in the hierarchy of things. But they're also playful. They're also nice and caring. They're watching us not to be creepy, but to be uh, protective. And they like to interact with us, but they want to make sure that we can handle it. That's why they don't just show themselves to everybody, because their goal is to protect us. They don't want to short circuit us. They don't want to freak us out or scare us. So you have to be ready. You have to really in your heart say, I am ready to see you. I want to see you. And then when you do see them, thank them, show them appreciation and gratitude and thank them. And then when you do all that, you can also play with them a little bit because they like to have fun. They're playful. So those are just my thoughts on my experience or watching. We literally were at the top of this mountain in Virginia at the Monroe Institute, which is one of the most sacred sites in the world it is basically a mystery school it's it's hogwarts <laughs> xavier academy jedi school wrapped into one it is an amazing place and i'm up there at night next to this gigantic crystal with ryan bledsoe sky watching calling in orbs just a surreal experience and i just wanted to give you my thoughts on that experience when i think of these orbs i think that they are truly magical and and like i said ancient spiritual beings very close to god here to watch us guide us protect us but also to interact with us and even play a little bit and have some fun so 
that's what I think. Let me know. What do you guys think, photos? Have a beautiful day. Peace. Oh, look at this. What's up? Is this color daughter or blonde? Oh my god. What is happening no here? No one is talking about this. Oh. Don't walk through the world looking for evidence that you don't belong. Because you will always find it. Yes. Don't walk through the world looking for evidence that you're not enough because you'll always find it. Our worth and our belonging are not negotiated with other people. We carry those inside of our hearts. I know who I am. I'm clear about that. And I'm not going to negotiate that with you because then I may fit in for you, but I no longer belong to myself. And that is a betrayal I am not willing to do anymore. Wow, so powerful. Tag someone who needs to hear this. Oh, look at this bird here. They decided to warm themselves after having a cold day out there. Hmm. And this dog here, then the mother said, I don't like apples. Oh, look at this. I saw the highest example of love in this life. You see, when apple was Brown. four and they were five, and the mother gave them. Was the beast mentioned in the book of Revelation exposed last night during the presidential debates? It sure was. And that's next on the trumpet. A presidential debate in the month of June has never happened in the United States. They are always months and months ahead in September and October. This one. This one. This one. So I'm not going to spend all night with you talking about the last 90 minutes. When I've been watching the last three and a half years of performance. But this was a debate that your campaign wanted. You pushed for this debate at this moment. She just said I've been watching him speak great things for three and a half years. And that's exactly 40 and two months. Concerns about his age, but this morning his performance is only fueling more and sending his party scrambling. This morning, panic and concern within the Democratic Party. They replaced Joe Biden as the candidate. He will have served for 40 in two months. A three and a half year term and 42 months are the same thing. And that's mentioned right there. But the dragon had one of its seven heads wounded. Person this is a uh, uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the, uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with uh, Look, if we finally beat Medicare. It says that the beast has seven heads, and that one right there is wounded. That chapter starts out with the whole seven head thing. And ten crowns right there. And if Vladimir Putin were standing here, there would be ten horns. A debate in June definitely was a setup so that they could oust him within the 42 months and deliver the prophecy. And that's the person that will probably be debating in September and October when they're supposed to. The dragon is the one that gave the beast the power. We know the number of the dragon and the beast is 666. And if you go to 666 United Nations Plaza, you'll see Trump Towers. It's right there. And right across from Trump Towers is 666 United Nations Plaza. We're going to touch that dot right there. And I'm going to scroll around a little bit. And there's the big Trump Towers right there. And then we're going to scroll right around a little bit. And there's the dragon being killed. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. That's fancy talk for 666. And no, that's not King George. That thing's got a head there and a head there, and there's a couple of heads laying around it. So it's a multi-headed dragon. The next few chapters do talk about the mother of all harlots and the fact that she wore purple. Color purple right there. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Russia makes this 
Ten kings, seven heads. I go by Ezekiel 33, 3, and that scripture says that when I see the sword fall upon the land, I blow the trumpet and warn the people so I can follow the trumpet for more. And in Jesus' name, have a blessed day. We have a, a clockwork mechanism that will ring the bell, but we've pumped out all the air from this bell jar, and so when I uh, start it running, you won't be able to hear it. You can see the hammer hitting the bell. It's got a life of its own, this plunger. I've got to hold on to it. Uh, but you, you can see it striking the bell, but because there's no air inside, uh, you can't hear it. Now, I'm going to let the air in. And as we let the air in, now I think you can hear the bell quite clearly. And that's a, a very nice experiment to demonstrate how um, air is needed for the transmission of sound. Oh, look at this. What was also found was that, shocking to say the least, look at the project's first video presented this. Oh, this is Apollo 1 or that mission when people oh. went to the moon, you see? Now how can they explain the sound? Later in the mission, it repeated loud mechanical sounding. Oh, what's up with the cow? Is the cow performing magic or gymnastics? Many of you oh have been my god. To believe this that cow your is stretching. mind is in charge, that it's supposed to control everything and figure out how everything is supposed to happen in order for everything to work. Your physical mind is not designed to understand how things happen. It is only designed to perceive how things happened. It is not designed to perceive how things will happen. It is only designed to perceive how things happened. The higher self, that level just above physical reality that is also part of your personal being is the level of your being that has the ability to understand how things happen. And that's why you heard us say, you don't have to worry, you don't have to focus on how something will come about. There is no way for you to know. It's not within the capacity of your physical mind to know that. It's only within the capacity of your physical mind to see how it did occur, but not how it will occur. The knowledge of how it will occur comes from your higher self, not from your physical mind. As we said last night of your time, again, pay attention, very crucial. The higher self conceives. The physical brain receives. The physical personality mind perceives. The physical personality mind does not conceive of anything. The physical mind is not capable of generating an idea. Not one. Not one. Any idea you have ever had has never come from your physical mind. Not one. It can only perceive the result of the idea that was received by the brain from the conception of the higher self. Beginning to understand this relationship will allow you to begin to have a better relationship and an open line of communication with the higher self and will allow you as physical minds to allow the you that is the higher self to do its job while the physical mind goes about doing the job it was designed to do, which is to simply focus you in physical reality so that you can perceive and experience the result of what you conceived from the higher self to be representative of your natural truth and joy. So, this knowledge and this understanding and this relationship
can allow you to relax and not feel like you have to do so much. It's not your responsibility in that sense as a physical mind to generate these things and figure out how it's all going to happen. As we said last night of your time, we recognize that the physical mind, if it is taught to think it's in charge, can get caught up in the idea of attempting to repeat how something did occur, thinking that what it is perceiving is actually how the next thing needs to occur, when in fact it's not. The idea of attempting to do that will only cause a repetitive cycle, a repetitive loop, that will simply allow you to remain stuck in one particular manifestational level, and it won't advance until you allow yourself to make the leap and let go of how you think it needs to happen and let the higher self show you how it can happen. And then let your physical mind simply receive, perceive how it did happen. So you don't need to carry those bags. You don't need to carry that luggage. It's too heavy. You weren't designed to carry it. If you keep carrying it, you will be exhausted very quickly. You will start dragging. You will say, life is a drag. This doesn't work. I'm not having any fun. Why not? Because you're doing too many jobs. You're not doing the job you were designed to do only. You're also attempting to do the job of the higher self. This can take seven years off your life. This can use up seven years of your life. This can take 49 years off your life. This can give you everlasting life. Who is Jesus to you? This is an experiment with a spinning wheel, quite a big wheel. It's of iron and weighs quite a lot of pounds. It's 13 inches diameter and it's mounted on a shaft three feet long. And you see lifting it, like this is quite an effort in itself. You'll see that it weighs about 40 pounds. And when I talk under stress like that, because it is a heavy thing to have to pick up. Now what I'm gonna do next is to spin it up to two and a half thousand revs a minute. When it's spinning, it becomes a live thing. Now whilst I'm lifting it, I'm going to talk so that you shall see from my voice that I'm not under any stress of any kind. In a minute, I'm going to let go with my left hand and holding with my right only on the far end of the shaft, I shall lift it five feet in three seconds and I shall talk to you quietly as I do it because it goes up all on its own, you see, without any real conscious effort from me other than simply steering it round a path that I happen to know it likes to go. Then we have the problem of stopping it. The higher self is the you that is on the mountaintop that has the big picture, that has the far view, that can look down at the physical mind in the valley and say, the road is this way. I'm telling you, turn left. I know you think you're supposed to turn right because you think you're in charge, but I'm telling you, turn left. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. You don't have to know how turning left is going to get you to where you want to go. I can see that it is because I'm on the mountaintop. You don't need to know. All you need to do is what? Trust me that I'm telling you the truth. Why would I do anything different? I'm you. When you understand that your higher self is truly an aspect of you, maybe you will be willing to start listening. Instead of thinking, because your physical mind has been taught to think it's in charge and thus doesn't trust anyone else's two cents, instead of thinking that your higher self is trying to deceive you, trying to trick you, can't listen to that guy, that gal, what does he know, what does she know about being down here in the valley? A lot. Because you are also it. And it is also you. What we are simply saying is this is the complete person. Higher self, receiver brain, physical mind, this is the complete persona. And when you compartmentalize yourself, you are not functioning literally, not functioning as a complete 
person. You are shunting responsibility and the load of the job to only one portion of your personality, only one portion of your persona, the physical mind, and expecting it to take up the slack, which it is not designed to do. You're putting too much weight on it, too much emphasis on it, and it's going to wear the physical you down to the point where it won't matter what the higher self says about taking this road or that road, you'll just be too exhausted to move. Just can't do it, sorry. The idea is, is that when you allow yourself to let the higher self pick up that slack by doing the job it was designed to do, your load will be lightened. You will be energized. You will be enlightened. You will feel freer. You will feel like you have more energy than you ever imagined possible. You will be able to move in the direction the higher self is suggesting because you will then not be weighed down by things that you don't have any business carrying with you. And it will make you feel free. And you can run down the road. And that means as soon as you give up the job that isn't yours, things will accelerate. If you think you need to lug all this luggage down the road, it's going to be slow going. When you drop what isn't yours, things will speed up because now you're not carrying extra weight. Things will accelerate. The paradox here is that because the physical mind has been taught to think it's in charge and has to figure out how everything is going to happen, it actually slows things down, even in the face of wanting things to speed up. It's doing exactly the opposite of what it actually really wants to have happen by taking on too much weight. So by letting that go and allowing yourself to function as the whole being, and trusting the how to the higher self and not thinking about it, not worrying about it in the physical mind as to how you're going to get where you know you want to be, then you will allow there to be balance on all levels of your being. Things will flow in that positive direction representative of your natural self because you will be behaving as your true, interconnected, holistic, natural self. I'm about to show you undeniable proof that the name of our Heavenly Father is Yahuwah, and the name of the Messiah is Yahusha. Check this out. So, the original language of creation, the language that the Most High Yahuwah used to create the earth, that He spoke, is ancient Hebrew. It's also the language that the original Bible was written in. Now, what I have here is the most ancient form of Hebrew. It's known as the Picto. And as you can see, each letter actually has a meaning and a symbol. I'm about to break down the Father's name and the Messiah's name and what they actually mean. Here's the Father's name, Yahuwah, in the Paleo Hebrew and then the Picto Paleo. You have Yod, He, Ua, He, which will mean hand, behold, nail, behold. That is literally prophecy of the Messiah's death in the Father's name. Yahuwah means Yah adds breath. Remember, he breathed life into Adam. This is where we get hallelujah from. It means praise added to Yahuwah. Now, let's break down the Messiah's name. Paleo and the Picto Paleo. Yod, He, Ua, Shin, Ayin. Which will mean hand, behold, nail, destroy, experience, or see. Wow, so they're actually seeing or he's experiencing the destruction of the body of Messiah by nails in the hand. How do people deny this name? On 543, the Messiah said, I have come in my father's name and you have received me not. If another comes in his own name, him you shall receive. He came in the father's name, Yahuwah. Yahusha. Yahuwah means Yah adds breath. Yahusha means Yah adds deliverance or salvation. The Sha comes from the Hebrew word Yasha, which means to save, to deliver, to be delivered, to be saved. And she shall bring forth his son, and you shall call his name Yahusha, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
because Yahusha literally means Yah adds salvation. He shall save his people from their sins. I, even I, am Yahuwah, and beside me there is no savior. This is Isaiah or Yahshua 4311. Yahuwah told us that he alone is the savior, and there's no other savior besides him. Look at the prophecy of Yahusha's name. It means Yah adds deliverance. Yah adds salvation. Yahuwah is Yahusha in the flesh. This is why they change all these names. There's so much prophecy about Yahuwah becoming the Messiah in the book of Isaiah, or originally called Yasha Yahu. Because remember, Yasha means to save or to deliver. So Yasha Yahu means salvation, Yah adds. But they change it to Isaiah. Come out of religion. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in Ruach, spirit, and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. Allahim, or the Mighty One, is that Ruach, that spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in Ruach and in truth. Don't listen to anyone who tells you His name doesn't matter. They either haven't done their research or they are operating from another spirit and that spirit is not of Yahuwah. The third commandment is literally not to lift or to take the name of Yahuwah to naught or to nothing. In religion they will tell you, oh he has many names, but that does not align with the scripture at all. Thus shall you say to the children of Yasharal, Yahuwah, this is my name forever, and this is my remembrance to all generations. Let me know what you guys think about this video. If this has edified you, please drop a like, a comment, a follow, share this with someone who needs to see it, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Shalom. You never call your spouse from across the house, from a different room. You don't summon each other. You don't talk to each other from a distance. You have something to say, come over and say it. Don't shout it from another room. It's not dignified. It's not respectful. I was up this morning and the Lord began to minister to me concerning a certain music group. Many of you know them and many of you may not know them. The Lord gave me a word concerning Maverick City. And the Lord said, I've raised them up. I've exalted them and they have forgotten about me. They have compromised for the things of this world. They have forsaken my commandments. They have forsaken my laws for the things of this world. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The Lord said they are not living a life that is pleasing to me. Many up and coming gospel singers, the purity that they carry, the genuineness of their worship, it will be tainted because they are solely under them. They will be deceived at some point if they connect with them. The Lord then went on to say, my hand is not on them. I've given them chances to repent and they refuse to. If they don't, they will perish. We serve a God that gives and that takes away. But one thing we must understand, God will never compromise his word for you. Wow, oh, man, that was interesting. It's always good news when you are talking about God Almighty, you see? Because after all, He's the creator of us all, and we all are an image of Him. So, my friends, it's why we should all be loving and unite as one. Let's read from the Book of Knowledge because of that, good people of us, you see? And our closing word of today, comes from the book of, of yeah. my friend where is that was uh -huh, yes Isaiah a guy called Isaiah 60 22 and this is what the book tells us the least of you will become a thousand the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. Wow. Good word from the book of knowledge. Uh, can you close for us, my friend, with a word of prayer? Father, 
we come before you, we give you thanks and glory and honor. We can't express our love to you with the words, Father. We just love you and respect you, Father. Father, thank you for the person who have watched up to the end. May you bless him or her. May you fulfill his or her wants. In Jesus' name, we pray this, believing and trusting. Amen. Amen. Till next time, God be with you, man. Bye-bye. Good vibes.